So hi everyone, I'm Sri Kumar, I'm one of the clinical oncologists based at Bex Living at Jimmy's and I'm going to take you through some of the basic principles of management of breast cancer. This would be the first of your big four lectures normally. So I'm hoping to cover some or most of these topics today. Certainly the slide set that you have will cover all aspects and of course if you have any questions you could find me later on. First of all about the incidence, like all cancers, incidence of breast cancer is age related. So you can see that less than 5% of the breast cancers will happen in women below the age of 40 and as we uh, grow older you can see that the incidence rate increases. More than 50% of these breast cancers are happening in women above the age of 50. One of the main questions that every time my patient asks me when there is a diagnosis of breast cancer is, why me? We don't have a single cause. For example, in lung cancer, we know that it's strongly linked to smoking. But in breast cancer, there is not a single cause. I've listed a series of causes because you can see that in general, uninterrupted estrogen exposure can increase the risk of breast cancer. There is a link with HRT, so there's data that's published to say that if, you, if a person's been using HRT for long periods of time, it can increase the risk of breast cancer. But one of the messages I want you to take away is this increased risk, the absolute increased risk is still very small. It's about 2% increase compared to somebody who's never used HRT. What about genetics? Now, this is a point that you do need to take away from today's lecture. Although the number of breast cancers that are hereditary is less than 5%, this is where you and I as doctors can certainly make a difference by taking a good family history. So when we look at genetically uh, related breast cancers, most of these hereditary breast cancers are related to the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes. And um, what you will find with these cancers are there's usually a cluster in the family. There, there will be younger members with breast cancer. There's usually a history of ovarian cancer. There's usually a history of bilateral breast cancer. And there may be men in the family with a history of breast cancer. So taking a good family history is actually very important in identifying that group who could then be referred on to the genetics team for further intervention. The other gene that can be related to the breast cancer is, as you know, the P53 mutation, which will come with, again, a cluster of breast cancer, of cancers which may not all be epithelial but you can get mesenchymal cancers as well but I'm sure you've heard of the leaf pneumonia and I will leave it with you. How are breast cancers detected? First a large number of breast cancers these days are detected through screening. So what is screening and what are the general principles of screening that I want you to take away today? Whenever you screen for a cancer the principles are that the cancer should be common there's no point in screening for a cancer that is very rare in the population. The second point is you have to be able to pick up the cancer early and early diagnosis should allow early intervention which, which should allow for an increased cure rate. The third point that I want you to take away is that the tool that we use should be user friendly. If it is not user friendly, you are not going to get a lot of normal population coming in for screening. The tool that we use should be sensitive, it should be specific, and it should be cost effective. And for breast cancer, um, it almost qualifies, all of these factors are actually um, satisfied by uh, NHS BSP screening, where we use routine mammogram for screening. And women are offered screening from the age of 50 to 70, and they're screened every three years. And any cancer that occurs in between is called interval cancers. They do occur, and they are certainly rarer. Now, the other principle that I want you to take away is you need to screen a large population to get a reasonable detection rate. The detection rate in breast cancer is about 8% per thousand. So you may get one breast cancer per 125 women and not all of these breast cancer may have had a different, may, may, may need to be detected is what I really mean. Now, but the downsides of any screening program is it causes anxiety amongst the patients, it can lead on to a lot more investigations and it can also cause overtreatment when a cancer is diagnosed and these points have to be borne in mind whenever you discuss screening with a patient. What is the 
other way that breast cancer is present clearly through symptoms. Now, if I am going to point out the key messages I want you to take away from this lecture and this slide is a very key slide that I want you to take away. So, the breast cancer can present in varying uh, with varying symptoms and signs and commonly the woman comes with a lump. But it is not just a lump, sometimes it can be a lump in the breast, but equally it may be a lump in the axilla. She may be presenting with an axillary lymphadenopathy. It could be due to nipple inversion, which is um, not common, but it is one of the signs. And the other thing that you need to think about is if there's skin tethering, particularly when she puts up the arm, that is the skin is pulled in and that might be due to an underlying cancer. Uh, one of the there may be nipple discharge, but most nipple discharges are physiological. But uh, if you get spontaneous nipple discharge, particularly copious amounts, particularly bloody, that needed that needs investigations. The last but the most important presentation that I would never want any of you to miss is a particular kind of breast cancer which we call inflammatory breast cancer. And this is very, very aggressive and uh, the patient does not usually have a lump. She comes with a very short history of a very swollen red edematous breast. It looks really like mastitis and it is very common to treat it as mastitis, give some antibiotics and send the patient away. But in this case, if you do not know that there is a particular cause for mastitis, please be vigilant, bring the patient back or at least make sure that the symptoms have settled. Otherwise, it needs a very urgent um, two-week referral. So, what happens next when a breast cancer is diagnosed or to be diagnosed? Both from the symptomatic group as well as from the screening group, they will end up in the breast unit where the patient will require a triple assessment. So, the triple assessment has obviously three main features. One is they need to be a clinical examination which is usually done by the surgical team. The next would be imaging, which is done by radiology. The commonest imaging tools are ultrasound and mammogram. We do use MRI, but MRI is not a common screening tool. MRI is only used in specific circumstances. As far as other imaging modalities are concerned, such as CT or PET, they are not very useful imaging tools for breast cancer in the breast itself, but they may be helpful in staging, uh, certainly looking for distant spread. The last key point in the triple assessment is clearly pathology. The pathology will be either co-biopsy from the breast lump, plus a co-biopsy from the lymph node or it could be a fine needle aspiration from the lymph node. So, unless all these three aspects of uh, diagnosis is done, it does not become triple assessment. So, if you do clinical examination and two imaging modalities, they are not triple assessment. For triple assessment, they should be clinical exam, radiology and pathology. Once a patient is diagnosed with breast cancer, what happens next? Clearly, you, you've got a diagnosis of the breast cancer. You probably would have staged the patient to know the exact extent of the disease. And once you've got all of those factors, you have to decide what you're going to do with the patient. And the patient is usually discussed at the diagnostic MDT, where there is a surgeon, the pathologist, the radiologist, and usually an oncologist and the extended team, which will be the breast care nurses and all of the details are put together and we make a treatment plan. The treatment plan can either be with curative intent, where clearly the aim is to eradicate the cancer in the breast as well as any microscopic disease, particularly micrometastatic disease, so that there is no risk of distant spread. Or it can be the palliative intent. Palliative intent is where based on all the information you have, you know that the disease is not curable either because it is locally advanced or because it has spread beyond the breast. Now, when you come to the radical treatment, I've divided into it into two bits. One is you could opt for surgery and then follow it up with adjuvant treatment where the surgery will get rid of the disease in the breast and plus the axilla. And then the adjuvant treatment is essentially to get rid of micrometastatic disease, uh, which is to eradicate distant spread and that will be with systemic treatment. And you may also need local regional treatment such as radiotherapy to get rid of microscopic disease in the breast. The other curative treatment that you can offer is neoadjuvant treatment. Neoadjuvant treatment is where you're going to give the systemic treatment first to downstage the tumor and then go in for surgery for local control. So, they just 
the aim of treatment for both these situations are curative, but it's slightly different sequencing of treatments. Now I'm going to move on to the curative local treatment. Many of you would have been uh, within the breast, uh, I've worked within breast units, so you know that the curative local treatment is usually the mainstay is surgery. The surgery to the breast can be a lumpectomy, which is called wide local excision, or it can be a mastectomy and there are varying factors that the surgeon will use to decide whether it should be a lumpectomy or a mastectomy and then the patient if the patient has a mastectomy they will be offered either immediate reconstruction to create the breast mound or the patient can have a reconstruction later on which is called a delayed reconstruction but that is only surgery for the breast you still need to take care of the axilla the axillary surgery is divided into two. If you already know from your imaging and staging that there are axillary lymph nodes that are involved, then you would do what's called an axillary clearance, which is to remove the glands. But if you, if the, if otherwise the staging had not indicated that the nodes were positive, you still need to stage the axilla surgically, which is by doing a surgery called sentinel lymph node biopsy. The central lymph node biopsy, the node is then examined and made sure that there is no microscopic disease. If the sentinel lymph node biopsy comes back as positive showing microscopic disease, then you will still need further treatment to the axilla which can be either a full axillary clearance or we could offer radiotherapy. So these are the surgical options for the patient in brief. What about the adjuvant treatments? I've already talked to you about adjuvant treatments and this slide I, I explains that in a, a, a little bit further. So you can see that there is a breast lump. The surgeon removes the breast lump, but whilst uh, the breast lump was growing in the breast, it, had, it has already thrown off micrometastatic disease. So you can remove the lump, but the micrometastatic metastatic uh, disease goes and stays in organs such as the liver, the lung or the bone and over time they become macrometastasis and become secondary cancer. So the aim is the surgeon removes the primary, we give systemic treatment that circulates through the body to get rid of the micrometastasis. The other is the adjuvant local regional treatment. So the surgeon has removed the lump and there is a clear margin, but still there could be microscopic disease elsewhere in the breast and you do follow it up with adjuvant radiotherapy to get rid of the local microscopic disease. So I hope you've understood the principles of main treatment and the adjuvant systemic and local regional treatment from this slide. Now here's a typical slide which is showing you an inflammatory breast cancer. You can already see that the breast is so large, so inflamed, so red, the surgeon can't operate on it because he, he has to remove all of that skin and there will not be enough skin flaps to bring together. And even if he does that, either it will necrose or the tumor will come along the skin flaps. So we would then give upfront systemic treatment, which is usually chemotherapy, to to shrink the tumor to allow the surgeon to operate and this is called neoadjuvant uh, treatment as I already told you before. Now I've put the TNM staging as a slide. I will not insult you by going through it, but it is so you know that uh, the, that stage is very, very important in deciding uh, the prognosis and also in making those therapeutic choices as I've already alluded to. Now I'm going to, I will talk about prognosis a little, prognostic factors a little bit later, um, but now I'm going to go on to the systemic treatments that the oncologist will offer. So what are the systemic treatments that an oncologist uh, dealing with breast cancer can offer to get rid of all of this microscopic disease that I've been talking about? So um, there is chemotherapy and I want you to think of chemotherapy as more like domestos. It, it isn't very targeted. You just throwing drugs at the cancer in the hope that it will damage the DNA and get rid of the cancer. Then there are the more directed treatment where you know that there is a target in the cancer and then you're hitting that target. And the most common is endocrine therapy, which where we know that the cancer is estrogen driven or it is ER positive, which will come in the next slides. And therefore you are uh, hitting the estrogen receptor by using endocrine therapy and the other common targeted treatment that we use these days is called the HER2 anti-HER2 treatment where you're directing the treatment at the HER2 receptor which the breast cancer is expressing. 
So if I just briefly go through each of them with you so that you understand the principles. If I take chemotherapy, I'm sure somebody else is already doing the big chemotherapy talk. But as far as breast cancer is concerned, I've summarized some of the regimens that we would commonly use. I wouldn't expect a fourth year medical student to to know all of this, it's because if ever you looking through someone's notes and you see FEC, EC, what the hell is this, then you know what it is, that's all. But the basic principles to take away are usually we can use chemotherapy both in the adjuvant, neoadjuvant and palliative setting. You need to know that these are usually given as combination treatments, so there may be more than one drug that we would use and this enables us to use um, drugs to their maximum dose and combine drugs with differing toxicity so that we can they're not toxic to the same organ we talk about chemotherapy as given in cycles um, and that really means sessions so they have usually six to eight cycles of chemotherapy each treatment is given once every three weeks those are the questions that you will get asked either as a junior doctor or even as a finally medical student when you're talking to patients. So if you understand those principles, that will be fine. And um, the last thing that I want you to take away, where did I, is uh, that there are significant risks from all of these chemotherapies. There are the immediate toxicities and the long-term toxicity. So whenever you're discussing uh, chemotherapy with a patient, you need to know the risk versus the benefit and um, and and ultimately the choice is your patients. So this slide here just illustrates the chemotherapy toxicities, many of which you already know. So there are the general toxicities, which you know about the hair loss, sickness, neutropenia, etc. But what I also want you to think about are the specific organ related toxicity, which can be very, very drug specific. So each drug may be toxic to a particular organ. For example, anthracyclines can cause cardiomyopathy. Uh, there may be platinum drugs, which can cause nephrotoxicity and you can have ototoxicity, you can have neuropathy. And some of these are long-term toxicities which are not usually reversible. And uh, whenever an oncologist is actually prescribing or choosing the drug, he or she needs to be fully aware of what each drug combination toxicity could be. We need to know the comorbidity of the patient or where, is there an organ compromise for this individual and am I going to damage her kidney or am I going to damage her heart? And you need to know all of this before you make a full treatment plan. Now I'm going to talk about the estrogen receptors. Uh, so if I hit, uh, if you look at it as uh, uh, I already said that they are proteins. So all these receptors are just proteins that the cancer cell is expressing. About 50% of breast cancers will express what's called the estrogen receptor. And if you can imagine it as a lock. So the lock is the estrogen receptor, the key is the estrogen. So if the cancer cell has a lock, the estrogen, which is the key, which we have women carry in plenty, will fit into the lock, turn the key, and then it sets off the cell signaling pathway, allowing cell growth. Okay, so you check for the estrogen receptor by immunohistochemistry, which is done in pathology. If, so what you can do is, if a cancer is actually expressing the estrogen receptor, you can block the you can block this ligand to receptor interaction either by getting rid of the ligand or by stopping the ligand from fitting into the lock, as I said. So you either get, throw the key out or don't get the key to fit into the lock. Okay. Now, how do you throw the key out? What is the key? The key is estrogen. So when I say throw the key out, what you're really doing is getting rid of the estrogen. If the patient is premenopausal, she's producing tons of estrogen from her ovaries. So if you want to get rid of the estrogen, you have to stop the ovaries. What's the easiest way to get rid of the ovaries? Remove the ovaries. So you can do surgical oophorectomy. We can give radiotherapy because uh, clearly uh, ovaries are exquisitely sensitive to radiotherapy, a whiff of radiation, it will die. But the downside of radiotherapy is you're exposing organs which did not need radiation to radiation and increasing the small but definite risk of a radiation-induced malignancy. So it's not a very favored method. 
The other method is by um, interacting or interrupting the pituitary um, ovarian axis. So, this is done by using drugs such as gosrolin or Zolidex and it will just quieten down the ovary and we call it uh, medical oophorectomy. So, the commonly favored are usually surgical oophorectomy or medical oophorectomy that get rid of the ovarian estrogen production. But there is still a lot of estrogen uh, production that happens in the extra ovarian tissues such as the fat, the breast, adrenal glands and we have to get rid of that and that is done by using a group of drugs which are called aromatase inhibitors and you will know of this drug called anastrozole. So, in the premenopausal woman you can use a combination of both and that will get your estrogen levels very very down or in the postmenopausal woman the ovary is already dead so you just use the aromatase inhibitor to get rid of the uh, extra ovarian estrogen production that is the principle of throwing the key out what about as i said stopping the key from getting into the lock what you do is you seal the lock and um, sealing the lock is done by tamoxifen and the principle is competitive inhibition so tamoxifen goes and sits on the lock it seals the lock so uh, the estrogen can't fit in in general, we tamoxifen can be used in pre and postmenopausal women, whereas aromatase inhibitor can be used only in women who've gone through ovarian um, uh, suppression or menopause. Now I'm going to I've put a slide which is looking at the adverse effects of endocrine therapy. I won't go through this, but there are two key points I want you to take away. One is it forms a large chunk of our work as breast oncologists and may be a part of a GP workload. Um, and there aren't easy answers to some of these side effects. But one of the things I want you to take away is the increased thrombotic risk uh, with, uh, associated with tamoxifen. So if ever you come across a patient who's on tamoxifen who's quite breathless, suddenly she will need a CTPA because it could be a PE. Uh, they may sometimes present with a clot in the brain. So that may be a risk for a stroke. And again, of course, the risk of DVT with sudden swelling. And uh, so the patients are usually warned regarding this and um, particularly when they're traveling, etc. But that's something medically you do need to be aware of. Coming to her to positive breast cancers, uh, this is a protein that is expressed by 15 to 20 percent of breast cancer and it is because there is, of course all proteins are controlled by genes and instead of having two genes you have multiple copies of the gene. So that's called gene amplification and the gene is called the HER2 new gene. So it's, so it's producing loads of this protein and it is a growth promoting protein. So if the breast cancer expresses this protein, it just sets off cell signaling pathways and allows cell growth and, the, and we have to stop this protein. And this is done by using the drugs called trastuzumab and pituzumab. Uh, these are not chemotherapies. These are actually monoclonal antibodies which will uh, hit the HER2 protein and it kill it, kills it off. And usually they're given again three weekly. They're given either intravenous or subcot. They don't have chemotherapy toxicity, but they can be cardiotoxic. So we do need to monitor the heart carefully. So I want you to finally take away that ER, uh, estrogen, Endocrine therapy is helpful only if a cancer is ER positive and anti-HER2 treatment is helpful only if a cancer is overexpressing the HER2 protein, but chemotherapy can be used for almost all cancers. I've already talked to you about radiotherapy uh, as adjuvant local regional treatment and uh, somebody again would have done the radiotherapy lecture. So I will not go through the principles of radiation, but basically kill cells by causing DNA damage. We talk in terms of gray, we talk in terms of fractions, in uh, which is really the number of treatments. So usually the adjuvant treatment for uh, breast radiotherapy is either is 15 treatments. So we give 40 gray in 15 sessions, but they're given over 21 days. But recently we have much shorter fractionation, which is much easier for the patient. And there is 26 gray in five fractions. So I just want you to know that we do use uh, radiotherapy. Now, I will leave you with the principle of immunotherapy. Um, again, from your lung lecture, you will learn a lot more about immunotherapy. It is 
not yet common in breast cancer it is coming and probably when I do the same lecture or someone else does it about a year later there may be more slides on immunotherapy um, but these are called checkpoint inhibitors and uh, it is particularly helpful in a group of breast cancers which are called triple negative breast cancers which means these are a group of breast cancers which is not expressing E or P or or HER2 uh, proteins. Now I promised you um, that I would go through the prognostic features. What I'm now going to do is I've talked a lot about surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. I'm going to use three cases just to take you through the principles of how an oncologist uses his or her tools and when they use it and how it's used. So clearly the first decision uh, that an oncologist has to make is why, when do I treat this patient? When does she need adjuvant treatment? When does she need new adjuvant treatment? And what are the treatments that I can offer this patient? And when question is usually answered by the prognostic features. So if I'm aiming to get rid of the micrometastatic disease, I need to know what the risk of micrometastatic disease is. Not, the breast cancer is a large spectrum of illness. So some of them have excellent prognosis and they don't need an oncologist. Whereas some of the patients have such poor prognosis that despite everything that an oncologist does, she may succumb to the disease. And this depends upon the original breast cancer and its pathology and the age that uh, of the patient. So I'm going to go through the prognostic factors. Clearly, you don't need me to tell you that the higher the stage, the worse the prognosis. So if a cancer is larger, so if the T size is bigger, or if there is a nodal spread, or if there are larger number of nodes, or if there's metastatic disease, the prognosis is worse. Besides that, the other factors that will influence the prognosis is the grade of the cancer, which you already know. So we call it grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. You may understand it as well differentiated, moderately and poorly differentiated. So the higher the grade, the worse the prognosis. The, the age of the patient, usually the younger women and the very older women tend to do worse because they're biologically bad cancers. Um, and the, the other most important factors are the molecular uh, marker expression or, the, uh, or as I've already told you, the protein expression of the breast cancers. Based on the protein expression of breast cancers, breast cancers can be divided into three, at least three main groups. One is called the ER or the hormone receptor positive breast cancers, which tend to do best. Then you get the group which is called the HER2 positive breast cancers. And then the worst group is the triple negative breast cancer. So the molecular markers not only tell us what treatments we can give the patient, but they are prognostic. So I'm going to illustrate this by the next slide. So here's a patient who is 63 year old. You've all seen this van by your Morrisons. The woman gets a letter through the letterbox she, um, and uh, she goes off to the, to the Morrison van, has a screening mammogram. And then uh, what happens next? The screening mammogram picks up a small mass in the breast. So the patient is called back, as I said, to the breast unit. She has triple assessment. She has further imaging, which will be a mammogram and an ultrasound, which is much more dedicated mammographic views. She has a co-biopsy. And of course, she's examined by the, uh, by the clinician, which is the surgeon. And then uh, she's, the final diagnosis is that this woman has a 1.5 centimeter invasive cancer, which is grade one. It hasn't gone into the gland and there is no evidence of spread elsewhere. What do we do next? So she gets discussed at this uh, diagnostic MDT and the surgeon says, oh yeah, it's a small cancer. There's no lymph nodes involved as far as I can see. So I will offer this patient wide local excision and sentinel lymph node biopsy. And she has that. And on uh, the pathology, uh, what does the pathology show? So the pathology finally comes as a 1.8 centimeter, well differentiated or grade one invasive ductal carcinoma. Sentinel lymph node is negative. The tumor is strongly estrogen and progesterone receptor positive, and it is HER2 negative. So I'm hoping you already know this is a fairly good cancer, but I'm going to show you how that works. So she then comes to an oncologist and the oncologist puts this to show the patient what her prognosis is. So you can, if you look carefully at this slide, you can see that her overall survival is excellent. Um, baseline survival is very, very good. And as an oncologist with my treatment, such as chemotherapy, I'm going to make less than 1% 
difference to a survival, which means I have to treat more than 100 people to save one life. And I wouldn't be giving this patient toxic chemotherapy because the risk of death from the treatments that I'm going to offer her is going to be um, higher than the benefit she's going to get from my chemotherapy. So there's no question of chemotherapy. We may discuss endocrine therapy and we may discuss radiotherapy. So here's a second patient. She's 45, so she's below the screening age. She goes to a GP with a palpable lump in her breast. Um, the GP uh, takes her full history, as you can see, uh, make sure that this is not really related to her cycles, examines her, finds a lump in the breast. There's a 45 centimeter mass in the breast, and there are glands under the axilla. What happens next? She's actually referred by a two week rule into the breast unit. In the breast unit, clearly, she's examined by the surgeon who confirms that there's a largish mass in her breast and palpable nodes in the axilla. This is confirmed on imaging to be malignant. She has a co-biopsy of the breast and a, co and a fine needle aspiration or co-biopsy of the axillary lymph node. And she then gets discussed again at the diagnostic MDT. So they confirm this to be a T3, N1, uh, ER positive, HER2 positive breast cancer. So you could go down two ways. You could say, okay, um, I can uh, give her neoadjuvant chemotherapy, downstage that tumor, and then make surgery easier. Or she can, she's just about operable by a mastectomy, so she can opt to have a mastectomy and an axillary clearance. And there, these are patient choices. Um, and so the patient chooses to have mastectomy and an axillary clearance. And this shows a 57 millimeter grade three invasive ductal carcinoma. Look at it, six glands are involved um, and she is e the tumor was ER positive and HER2 positive and she is much younger than your other patient. So again, I'm hoping you're formulating thoughts on the prognosis from this cancer as opposed to the first one. And here you can see that without treatment, her 10-year survival is something like 8%. So a, a large chunk of these patients without any further treatment are going to die from their breast cancer. So what we would then do is clearly stage the patient to make sure she's not at, she's not got metastatic disease already. And, assume, and if we assume that the CT is negative, we would throw everything at her. So we would give her the most... Um, strong or the most effective combination chemotherapy, anti-HER2 treatment, long duration of endocrine therapy in the hope that we would maximize the chances of cure. But I want you to take away it is nowhere near 100%. So what I've tried to illustrate are the two differences simply based on the prognostic factors that we have already talked about. The last slide is a 35-year-old lady who presents to a GP, loss of appetite, examination, large lump in the breast, palpable heptomegaly. You know what's going to come after this. CT shows metastatic disease. I don't need you to tell you that the intent of treatment here is essentially palliative. But even in the palliative setting, we are using the same tools. We will still look for the receptor status for the ER, PR, and HER2 and still use the same modalities but completely different treatment intent. Okay? And I just want you to look at this slide. So this is an elderly woman. You may come across this. Usually what happens is the patient's admitted to the elderly care ward. Um, and normally they've hidden this cancer because they're scared. Somebody will undress them either to get them washed or uh, somebody usually is getting undressed either because they need a chest x-ray or an ECG. And lo and behold, this comes to light. Uh, this is this may not be metastatic, but it is locally advanced and therefore it's not operable. So our treatment choices becomes, uh, it is palliative because it is not curative at this, once it's get to this point, it's a T4 cancer. So we would normally give either palliative radiotherapy um, and also look at receptors again and look at the possibility of chemotherapy, but that depends upon her age. She looks quite elderly and chemotherapy may not be our first choice. So I just want you to take away all of these principles um, uh, that I have uh, talked about. And the last slide is this I've already talked to you about is if you have any questions, come back and find me and I've actually put my e email and also some of the useful websites you could go to. Thank you.